Good afternoon. I'm Eve Samples, Executive Director at Friends of the Everglades. We were founded by Marjorie Stillman Douglas in 1969, and I want to welcome you to our clean water conversation. It's our first of 2022, and I'm here today with Gil Smart, who's Executive Director of Vote Water. He also serves as the Policy Director for Friends of the Everglades. We are sister organizations. And we're going to talk about what we are seeing so far this legislative session in Tallahassee. Um, we are in week three of the 60-day legislative session. And I have to tell you that those of us who track environmental bills uh, have been running fast out the gate at the start of the new year. There's a lot going along on, a lot to talk about. And, and Gil is going to share a lot of his knowledge with us today. Um, so just very high level observations before we dig into some of the bills we're seeing. Um, you know, despite all of the water quality problems we know are persistent in Florida, it seems that every year in Tallahassee, there are bills filed and bills that gain traction to erode our pollution regulations that are on the books, to erode our other environmental pr protections on the books, including for seagrass, which is something we're going to talk about today. So the, the theme is similar to past legislative sessions in Tallahassee. And, and those of us who speak up on these things, um, we tend to feel like we're playing a lot of defense. So you'll yeah. hear being an environmentalist in Florida when the legislature in session is like being a hockey goalie playing like one of the top teams in the world. You're blocking all sorts of shots and doing stick saves and this and that and the other thing. Uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's uh, amazing given the extent of Florida's environmental problems, especially its problems with its water quality, that you see this legislation that really, you know, whatever the rationale behind the legislation, it can really only result in in more water quality problems. And there are several bills that sort of, you know, fit that bill this year. Uh, again, they're, they're designed for specific purposes and the purpose may be in, in theory sort of laudable, but when you look at it and when you look at what it would do, you know, we already have problems with too many nutrients in our waterways, you know, blue green algae on the East Coast, red tide on the Gulf Coast, you know, all sorts of problems with, with our springs, with our lakes, with our estuaries. You know, we're trying to head these bills off at the past, but some of them have momentum. Some of them maybe thankfully have less momentum than we anticipated. The legislature itself is focused on some sort of high, you know, some high profile issues this year that, you know, in many respects don't involve the environment. One that kind of sort of does is the issue of net metering. Uh, you may be following this and, and Florida Power and Light's involvement in this uh, effort to sort of reduce, I guess, the amount of money that's paid to people who have rooftop solar. That's an issue for a lot of environmental groups. There's the response to the Surfside condo collapse. There's legislation out there that would really sort of rein in home rule by making uh, local uh, cities and municipal and counties rather uh, uh, could be the subject of lawsuits if they pass, you know, bills that are going to sort of impact businesses' bottom line, that sort of thing. But there are a couple, you know, very, very important measures that we are tracking uh, and that, you know, we believe if they pass, they're going to have sort of very significant uh, impact on water quality here in uh uh, in Florida. Yeah. So, so we're, we're going to walk you through those. Um, and, and before we get into the nitty gritty of, of these bills, we have about half a dozen bills we want to talk to you all about and, and make you aware of. Um, and if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. We're going to have time for Q&A. Um, but I, I just want to highlight what our priorities at Friends of the Everglades were uh, heading into this session. We, we posted a legislative preview that you can see on our website, everglades.org. So they're, they're pretty simple conceptually. Stop pollution at its source. And again, we see efforts to undercut that every session <laughs> of Tallahassee. Prohibit oil drilling in the Everglades and Big Cypress. Strip particle emissions from the list of protected farming activities. That relates to sugarcane burning. We're going to talk about that. Fully fund the state's land buying program, Florida Forever. Support rights for the environment, legal rights for the environment, and stop the assault on home rule, which, which Gil alluded to. So we're, we're going to hit on a, a bunch of those. And um, before, one more thing before we dive in, you know, there was some big news in the Everglades world last week in terms of funding. So President Biden announced that we're going to get 
more than a billion dollars for Everglades restoration funding. It's a lot of money. Governor DeSantis has also pumped a lot of money into Everglades restoration projects, these big dirt moving projects. And that's good and we need it. Um, however, we have to protect this giant state and federal investment by protecting water quality, by adhering to the rules on the books, by not eroding the rules on the books in terms of pollution. So that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So with that, um, I'm going to ask you, Gil, to um, dive into one of our first bills we want to talk about today. And here it is. Yeah. So uh, this this is has caught the attention of I want to say most, maybe virtually every environmental group in Florida. If you follow these issues at all, you know that seagrass has been dying off in Florida and parts of Florida at an astonishing rate. The Indian River Lagoon, the Florida Bay, uh, seagrass has really just, you know, and this is a this is a product of poor water quality, largely. Uh, poor water quality kills off seagrass. And everybody's aware of the issues with the manatees this year. More than 1,000 manatees died last year, and that's largely because their loss of habitat, seagrass, which is also food for them. Now, and algae blooms tend to choke off sunlight, you know, that the seagrass needs to grow, that sort of thing. So everybody in Florida wants more seagrass. But the problem is these legislative proposals that are out there this year would, quote unquote, you know, achieve more seagrass by killing seagrass. And let me explain what I mean by that. Senate Bill 198 and House Bill 349 would create what are called seagrass mitigation banks. You may be familiar with the concept of mitigation banking. The basic concept is that if I destroy something over here, I have to create that same something over there. Okay, so that there's no net loss. We do it with uh, uh, with wetlands. Uh, we do it with uh, uh, mangroves. Now there is a proposal, uh, two proposals, a bill in the House and a bill in the Senate in Florida. And actually, they mirror uh, proposals that died in the legislature last year. The idea would be that it would authorize the State Board of Trustees to create these mitigation banks. Seagrasses would be planted on state submerged lands, generating credits, which could then be sold uh, or purchased by those who are looking to do a project, let's say maybe build a dock that would have quote unquote unavoidable impacts on seagrass. In other words, if I want to build a dock and I know that's going to kill some seagrass, what I would need to do if this legislation were to pass would be to go to the, the, the mitigation bank and I would buy credits that were generated when somebody else planted seagrass somewhere else. This is being pitched as you know, a sort of another tool in the toolbox to slow, prevent, reverse the decline of seagrass in Florida. Unfortunately, our analysis is, and a lot of people have reached the same conclusion, that this would actually hasten the decline and the death of seagrass in Florida. It would actually result in more seagrasses being killed off because planting seagrass, number one, is incredibly difficult. OK, it, it basically there's something like a, a 30 percent success rate. It may actually be lower than that. Um, it's not just you can't just go plant it and have it grow and thrive, you know, particularly in areas that have water quality problems where the seagrass, the native seagrass in the area is already having problems. OK, so number one, you're taking a chance by killing the seagrass here. We'll just grow it there. Well, what if it doesn't grow there? What if we're not able to, to make it grow there? You know, what are the what mechanism would be in place to ensure, ensure that whatever seagrass you plant over there actually grows, actually thrives, actually does the job? There isn't. You can't really, you can't have that. Okay. You can't promise that it's going to grow because you don't know if it's going to grow. So we're trading basically a sure thing, seagrass that's living, that we're going to kill with this dock or whatever the project is, for you know, taking a chance, number one. Number two, um, uh, the whole idea of this legislation seems to be to make coastal development easier, okay? Because right now, there are very few options. Right now, if you want to build a dock or you want to build a project that's going to kill seagrass, you have to find some sort of way, some sort of means of mitigation, and there's no formal mechanism allows you to do that. You can, for example, go remove derelict boats which are shading seagrass and causing seagrass to, uh, to die. You know, that's that's considered mitigation right now. Problem is there aren't enough derelict boats around to, you know, basically to, 
to uh, not enough supply for all the demand. There's a lot of quote unquote demand for these people wanting to build these projects. It's going to kill seagrass. So the creation of a seagrass mitigation bank, and this is the biggest problem with it, I believe, as far as we're concerned, it would create a formal mechanism by which seagrass could be destroyed. And we're saying, well, no, we'll plant it over here again. Talk, talk about the Indian River Lagoon. Take the Indian River Lagoon, which has lost a tremendous amount of seagrass. In this legislation, there's no requirement that the seagrass you're going to grow would actually be grown in the Indian River Lagoon. You could plant the seagrass in Jacksonville. You could plant it over in Tampa. You could plant it somewhere else as a means of getting a permit to do a project that would destroy more seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon. Eve, this, this legislation is just bad news all around. Yep, we are extremely concerned about it. And we're especially concerned because it's masquerading as a bill that is good for seagrass. So we have a, a picture of a manatee here and it's really important to remember the timing. This is being asked for while we have an unusual mortality event for manatees in Florida. More than 1,100 manatees have died over the past year large part due to seagrass mm -hmm. loss. It is a primary dietary staple for manatees. And you may have heard that there's a fish and wildlife pilot project going on right now, whereby we are feeding manatees romaine lettuce in an area of Brevard County because seagrass is so hard to come by. Um, so really bad timing. We're concerned about it. And there's a really excellent article in the Florida Keys Free Press just today that quoted the top scientist on seagrass at Florida International University. He said this is a, a bad bill and it, it appears to be looking to make it easier for people to build docks that damage seagrasses that will lead to loss of seagrass without any assurance that what's replanted will thrive. Um, and just one final point from my perspective and Gil, I know you listened to the committee hearing on this back in December um, when State Representative Randy Fine, who's from the Brevard County area, and I will say um, Representative Fine uh, does not often get assertive on environmental issues that we see. He got very assertive on this one because his home district has been decimated in terms of seagrass loss. And he made one of the best points against the bill that I've heard. And his point alludes to something you said, Gil. He said, it's hard to get permits for the, these seagrass destroying projects today. This bill would make it easier. So it's not a good bill. So we, we couldn't agree more. And we also have heard the Florida Keys Fishing Guides Association as opposed to the bill. And there's a lot of criticism of it. Unfortunately, it appears to be moving. I mean, what's what's your read, Gil, on um, the progress, the momentum of this bill? Well, I don't know. You know, the Ocean Conservancy came out against this bill uh, in the last couple of days. There's a mounting amount of criticism of this bill, as you just noted, Eve, uh, Florida fishing guys are now mobilizing against this. They see the threat. You know, Randy Fine, uh, Representative Randy Fine, represents an area including portions of the Indian River Lagoon that's been crushed by seagrass loss. Florida can ill afford to lose any more seagrass. And any sort of legislation that's ultimately going to result in a net seagrass loss, proponents claim this is not going to happen with this bill, you know, unless we come up with some magic means of growing seagrass and ensuring that it lives and thrives, I don't see how it can lead to anything but a net loss of seagrass. People are beginning to realize this. There's a lot of organizations, like I said, that have sort of taken up, the, you know, taken up the, the, the flag against these proposals. Uh, whether that's going to be enough in the legislature, I guess we'll just have to wait and see, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's worth mentioning who's sponsoring this legislation. So on the Senate side, it's Senator Anna Maria Rodriguez. She represents South Dade County and the Florida Keys. And I know she's hearing from some of her constituents about their concerns. Obviously, seagrass is vital to the success of the Florida Keys fishing industry. They lost an immense amount of seagrass in 2015 that really damaged the local economy. And on the House side, it's being co-sponsored by State Representative Toby Overdorf, who represents the Stewart area, which also has suffered from a loss of seagrass and toxic algae discharges um, and, and a really vicious cycle of seagrass loss and water quality harm. Um, and then co-sponsored by Tyler Soroy. So it's, it's worth um, knowing those names. And if they represent you, it's worth reaching out to them. Mm. Uh, just briefly uh, from uh, you cited earlier, the Keys News uh, report on this this issue, which was very well done. 
They spoke to a guy, a uh, Florida International University research scientist, James Forqueen, the leading expert on seagrass in the state of Florida, who said he spoke with Senator Rodriguez before this legislative session. Uh, he said he supports the goal of protecting and restoring seagrass, but this bill would not accomplish those goals. Uh, yet the bill is is out there. The bill was nonetheless sponsored by Senator Rodriguez. And, and as Eve noted, they seem to be moving forward. So. Right. And one last point on this, and then we're going to move on to our next bill. Uh, Governor Charlie Chris vetoed a very similar bill in 2008 because it was problematic. So it's no better now. In fact, our, our water quality problems in Florida are arguably worse. We certainly have lost more seagrass since then. So it, it remains a very concerning bill. And we hope that the committee chairs who um, have this uh, pending in their committees do not schedule it for a hearing. So. Moving right along here past our manatee friend, um, we're going to talk about fertilizer rate tailoring. Can you tell us what that's all about, Gil? So uh, this is a bill by Senator uh, Senate Bill 1000 and its companion bill, House Bill 1291. Senate Bill 1000 uh, has been sponsored by Senator Ben Albritton, who's a farmer. Uh, he's a citrus farmer. And, I, you know, I think that this bill is designed to help farmers. Uh, Senate Bill 1000 would allow what's called rate tailoring for farmers, which means they would there's certain regulations in place now as to how much fertilizer farmers are allowed to use on their fields. And it, it's based on a variety of factors, but it's sort of a one size fits all sort of thing, with the goal obviously being uh, that we're trying to prevent nutrients from the fertilizer from running off into the waters where they cause problems. And you have to understand a sort of a baseline understanding for all of this, which is that agricultural fertilizer runoff is a huge, huge factor in terms of our degraded water quality here in Florida. OK, we're running behind trying to keep up with this problem, phosphorus and nitrogen in particular. OK, uh, so anything that's going to increase the amount of runoff of, of these nutrients into the waters is going to be a problem. And this bill looks like it well could do that. The idea is that farmers would be allowed to hire a, a certified professional, quote unquote, who'd have to meet certain specifications, have to have certain qualifications, who could come in, take a look at the farm and basically craft a plan rate tailoring that would allow you to uh, utilize the amount of fertilizer appropriate for what you're trying to produce. Now, in the real world, this means one thing. This means you're going to be able to use more fertilizer than the current regulations permit. Um, you know, uh, All Britain is a citrus farmer and citrus farming without a doubt is in trouble. This is, I was reading a story this morning that, say, that said Florida's citrus crop this year due to, you know, a greening uh, and other issues is projected to be the lowest that it's been since World War II. So you understand how Florida citrus farmers might be sort of feeling a little desperate at this point. Unfortunately, we can't save Florida farms, Florida citrus farms, by sacrificing our water quality because it stands to reason that if you put more fertilizer on the land, you're going to run the risk of more runoff. Now, Senate Bill 1000 would require farmers who, who utilize this rate tailoring to enroll in the state's best management practices, which are means by which farmers manage their farms to mitigate, to minimize runoff. The problem with that is they would also be granted what's called the presumption of compliance, which is to say that so long as they're enrolled in these best management practices or BMPs, the state doesn't actually come in and test the water to make sure they're meeting the pollution reduction goals. The state takes it on faith. Well, if you're enrolled in the BMP, surely you're meeting the pollution reduction goals. OK, this legislation basically would allow farmers to apply more fertilizer. And as long as they're enrolled in the BMP, they don't have to worry about the state coming in and checking and seeing if anything else is running off into the, into the waterways. So uh, there's more there's more to it, but that's ba basically the gist of it. This is sailing, the Senate Bill 1000 anyway, is sailing through the legislature. It's already on its third committee stop. House Bill 1291, the companion measure in the House, has not uh, had a hearing yet. But we anticipate it will. This uh, this uh, Senator All Britain, very powerful guy, and this is one of his priorities. Uh, he's looking to drive this through, and there's been very very little opposition uh, so far to it. But but Eve, this this bill is just bad news as well. 
Agreed. So Senator Albritton will be the Florida Senate president in 2024. So as you said, he has clout in the legislature and, and there's reason to believe this will gain traction. We're extremely concerned in part because of what's alluded to in this headline that we have on the screen here. So if you haven't read it, there was an excellent series of investigative stories in Treasure Coast newspapers done by Max Chesnes and Sydney. Saison, I hope I didn't butcher her last name there. Uh, and, and they examined Florida's basin management action plans. These are the plans that are supposed to address nutrient pollution in Florida's waterways. And what they found is that year after year, the state of Florida is not meeting its own targets for these basins. Um, Lake Okeechobee is the poster child. Um, we are missing targets for nutrient pollution, phosphorus and nitrogen year after year. So why, when we're missing targets for pollution limits, and we've seen the effects of that in the form of toxic algae blooms, why would we pass legislation to liberalize fertilizer application? It just doesn't make any sense. Certainly, we want to have viable farms in Florida, um, but they need to be um, operated in a manner that doesn't destroy our waterways and, and thereby impact our economy. So we're, we're very concerned and tracking this. But as Gil said, it does seem to be moving. And understand that the, the best management practices or BMPs, which I alluded to, are the key aspect of these BMAPs, these basin management action plans. In other words, farms uh, in these areas, these, basin, these basins uh, that are required to enroll in BMAPs, the whole idea is that by enrolling in these programs, there's going to be fewer nutrients in the water and then these BMAPs will meet their goals. The fact that the BMAPs aren't meeting their goals is an indicator that the BMPs, the best management practices, are not working. And again, this is these this program. You know, the farmers are exempt from actual testing for the most part. They get the presumption of compliance. And now we're going to so we're going to extend a program that's not working, that's already not working, to agricultural operations that are going to be applying more fertilizer. And somehow that's going to work. I don't think so. Yeah, this is a chart that illuminates what was. A, a explained in the reporting from Treasure Coast newspapers. So the purple line at the bottom is the, the limit on phosphorus that we're supposed to be trying to hit in the Lake Okeechobee Basin. And every year since 1995, we've been way above that limit. So no wonder we have impaired waterways, no wonder we have toxic algae blooms. And again, these phosphorus levels, the majority of the phosphorus input into the lake more than 80% is from agricultural sources. So we do not need to um, expand on those sources to grow them. And there's a picture of citrus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gil, um, I think we can move on to the next topic and it actually segues quite nicely. Um, we're gonna talk about innovative technology to address some of these harmful algal blooms we've seen. So um, just real quick by way of background, we've witnessed terrible blue-green algae blooms in the state of Florida um, really since 2013, although they, they happened before that. And in the last couple of years, we're seeing more of a desire on the part of the state of Florida to address these acute blooms with technology, um, basically zapping them with algicides. So um, there's a bill that relates to that, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Gil, to talk about it. Right. So uh, uh, these bills, uh, Senate Bill 834, House Bill 421, uh, in theory, I mean, they're a good idea, right? Uh, you know, we would prefer, and we always say this, we would prefer that the state of Florida would would try to solve this problem by doing what is our number one legislative priority, stopping pollution at its source. This is kind of like sort of a bit like closing the barn door after the horses have run away, you know, several days ago. Uh, instead of actually stopping pollution at its source by doing things like, you know, cracking down on farms where too much fertilizers run into the water, we're going to do this. We're going to, technology is going to save us, right? Well, maybe it will, okay? Maybe maybe some of these technologies that are out there can clean up the water, can, you know, clean the blue-green algae or red tide or whatever it is out of the water. So in theory, this might be a workable idea, but the problem is we don't know how effective and how safe some of these technologies are going to be. For example, right now, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection has seven 
projects going on around the state where it's, you know, implementing this innovative technology. Vendors come in and they say, hey, I've got this great idea. I've got this great product. I've got this great machine or whatever it is. Uh, and, and it's going to clean the water, the blue green algae. There are actually seven different projects around the state where the technology is currently being evaluated right now. OK, it's been deployed. It's out there. They're trying to wait and see if it works. This legislation would basically permit DEP to adopt this on a larger scale. OK, our problem with this legislation is there's nothing in the proposals that say this technology, these technologies must have been proven effective, must have been proven safe. We advocate, uh, for example, that there be some sort of peer review process that before we go out there and we start, you know, dumping algicide or whatever it is into the water, that we know for a fact that that's not going to cause more problems than it solves, that it's actually going to work. Because otherwise, you've got a situation where you're going to have all these vendors with all these wonder products coming to the state and getting millions of dollars, you know, maybe more to, to implement these technologies that maybe in the long run don't actually solve the problem, but maybe actually cause some problems. You know what I mean? So this is this, is, I think, is our main concern with this with this bill of, uh, uh, you know, the Blue Green Algae Task Force appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis uh, uh, put out its recommendations in 2019. They talked about high tech uh, uh, solutions to this problem uh, at a June 2020 meeting of the task force. Uh, 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 members said the department uh, the directed the department to consider employing independent scientific peer review to evaluate Project proposals and project evaluations. We think that's a good idea, but it needs to be written into the legislation. OK, if we're going to do this, you know, if we're going to pursue this solution, we have to make sure it's safe and effective and cost effective as well. I mean, that's another factor, too. What, what is it going to cost? Is it scalable? You know, those sorts of questions. So, again, this is something I think, Eve, we could support, but we need some guardrails here. Exactly. And we are going to be providing uh, feedback to one of the bill sponsors um, because we don't want to just sit here and, and criticize bills. We do want to be constructive and, and help make them better. And this is something that could be useful. This, this picture here shows the Pahokee Marina from 2021. Last year in the spring, there was an early season toxic blue-green algae bloom on that part of the lake. And we understand that if, if people are living aboard on those boats, you need to take some emergency measures to address the algae that poses a very acute public health threat to them. However, we need to follow up and, and see what the long term effects are. We need to see if they're harmful, if there are unintended consequences. And also, as Gil said, if they are cost effective, this is also an issue of just fiscal conservatism. Um, if we're going to pass a bill that's going to expand the pot of money to be used for these quote unquote innovative technologies, let's make sure that Floridians are getting our money's worth in, in these taxpayer funds. Um, and just to elaborate a little bit, I mean, these treatments can be physical, they can be biological, they can be chemical. And this is from the analysis of the bill, um, things like ultrasonic surface mixers, oxygenation, hydrogen peroxide, geochemical compounds such as alum and biological treatments. Again, some of those may be prudent, safe, may help us in acute situations like in this picture. Um, we just don't know. And the Blue Green Algae Task Force members, who we have a lot of respect for, these are the leading minds in, in terms of harmful algal blooms in Florida, they want to see peer review and, and tracking of, of what we're doing here. And that's just not written into the bill yet. So it's um, not quite fully baked from our perspective. So I'm going to advance this slide here, and I just want to show the story. This is from May 4th, 2021 in the Palm Beach Post. It, it shows some of the quote-unquote innovative technology used then, so algicide used at the Pahokee Marina. This, this is the kind of stuff we're talking about, and, and what are the long-term impacts? We just don't know. All right, moving right along here, um, we're going to talk about sugarcane burning now. This is a really important issue for Friends of the Everglades. I think it's one of the most, if not the most, um, concerning example of an environmental injustice in Florida, burning sugarcane and how we burn it when the winds blow towards the Glades communities, but not when it blows east to the wealthier areas of Palm Beach. So there's a bill related to that, and I'm going to hand it over to Gil to talk about it. Right. So uh, this follows on the heels of last year's legislative session where the legislature passed and Governor DeSantis signed 
Senate Bill 88, the quote unquote expanded right to farm bill. Uh, it did a lot of things, uh, you know, expanded protections for agritourism, that sort of thing. But one of the most, from our pers pers perspective, nefarious aspects of this bill was the fact that it wrote particulate matter into the law as something that farmers are uh, to be protected from lawsuits against. This relates almost entirely to the burning of the pre-harvest burning of sugarcane. You see the, the photo uh, sort of on your screen now. What happens is the sugar industry prior, which you know is sort of centered in the, the Glades region south of Lake Okeechobee, uh, not too far from where we are. The sugar industry burns the fields before harvesting the sugar cane as a way to sort of burn off or get rid of sort of a lot of the veg, you know, the, the leaves and, and that sort of thing and to prepare the harvest for harvest. The problem is, as you can see in this photo, it generates a tremendous amount of smoke, uh, ash. They call it a, a black snow uh, in, in the glades areas. It's, you know, it, it floats in, it settles down. It causes all sorts of respiratory problems for people who live in these regions where they have to deal with this. This is a, on your screen now, you see this is a screenshot from uh, sort of a landmark uh, investigation by the Palm Beach Post and ProPublica, a nonprofit uh, journalism organization. It, this smoke, the ash, it drifts towards these glades communities. The people who live in those communities, they hurry inside. Their kids develop respiratory illnesses. There's all sort of other health problems associated with this. Of course, as this says, sugar companies say the air is safe based on, you know, air quality monitoring by, what is it, Eve? one air quality monitor in the entire glades region that wasn't even working correctly? Right. And that one got fixed, um, but the way it measures air quality remains problematic. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's highly dubious. And the thing to know about this, as Eve alluded to, is the fact that, you know, when the wind is blowing towards the wealthy coastal communities, the sugar companies aren't allowed to burn because that would upset the people in those wealthy coastal communities. But when the wind is blowing towards the poor, uh, uh, you know, disadvantaged communities in the Glades region, well, let it go. Let it burn. Let it burn. Let it let it go. Don't worry about it. And the state doesn't worry about it. And it's it is it is, as Eve said, a sort of a really stark example of environmental injustice, environmental racism, frankly, because these communities are largely black and brown people who have to deal with this. So this has been on our radar screen for a while. What uh, these bills uh, that are uh, the House Bill uh, 6085 is sponsored by Rep. Anna Eskamani. The Senate Bill, Senate Bill 1102, is sponsored by uh, Senator Gary Farmer, would strip the particle emissions line from Senate Bill 88, the legislation that passed last year. Uh, again, uh, that legislation was specifically designed to protect uh, uh, sugarcane farmers, sugar, the sugar industry, from lawsuits. There is a class action lawsuit that has been filed. It's been around for a little while out there by some residents of the Glades communities alleging that this, this practice has caused them harm. Uh, obviously, there may well be others who would like to make similar claims who have been harmed. This legislation that passed last year makes it impossible to sue on that basis. If these bills are successful in stripping that out of there, that could change. So, uh, but Eve, unfortunately, neither of these bills have gone anywhere fast. And given the politics uh, up in the state capitol, that may not change. Right. Um, you know, we, we support this repealer bill very much. We think particle emissions should not be listed in protected farming activities. Um, and, and just to translate what we're talking about, the bill that passed last year, the right to farm bill, said if you live more than half a mile away from um, a sugarcane burn, and, and this I'm paraphrasing here, but this is the effect. If you live more than half a mile away, you cannot ask a judge to determine if you have been harmed by the smoke, the ash, the black snow, as it's called, from these burns. Um, and, and we're just saying, let a judge decide. Don't preclude Floridians' rights. Don't preclude residents' legal rights to ask for a remedy in court. Um, that's only fair. So there's there's a lot of pushback to this bill. Um, in fact, just the other day, there was an op-ed in the Tallahassee Democrat attempting to say that this would preclude controlled burns from occurring. And let's just be clear here. This is about farming activities, farming operations. It's clear in the bill. We're not talking about halting controlled burns. And if there's a concern about that, then let's tailor the repeal to make sure controlled burns, you know, to prevent fires are safe. That looks to us like a big old distraction. 
The real issue here is sugarcane burning and <coughs> our state's leaders are working to fix that problem. And that is a bipartisan um, neglect there. Um, Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Fried could stop burning tomorrow if she wanted to. And the legislature also should be taking a, a much tougher approach to protect residents in the Glades communities. Um, a, a native of Belle Glade, Robert Mitchell, is on our board of directors at Friends of the Everglades, and he can attest to the impacts on himself growing up, his family who, who lives there full time still. Um, so just a real issue. And we're going to keep banging the drum on this. And, and we are appreciative to Representative Anna Eskimani and Gary Farmer for filing this repeal bill. I see uh, in the, the chat here, uh, Sharon Livingstone has asked, didn't 60 Minutes do a story on this? I'm not sure about that. But Eve, you could talk about there was a fascinating investigation uh, a few months back uh, having to do with sort of the, some of the smokiest counties. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because it was just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And if you go to our website, everglades.org, and go to our latest news tab, um, there's a section on sugarcane burning where you can look at a map. This was done by Stanford University in conjunction with National Public Radio researchers. They mapped the smokiest zip codes in the country. And, and they took on this project largely because of uh, wildfires out west. And what they found was zip codes around Lake Okeechobee had some of the, the worst smoke days in the country. And that's because of sugarcane burning. So when you look at that map and you see the, the dark red in Florida, everything else in Florida looks great you know, on the coast, mm -hmm. but it's clearly happening where sugarcane is burned. So um, this is a real problem. I, I didn't see the 60 Minutes piece. I'll need to go look for that. But there was an excellent video that ProPublica released just within the last month, um, showing how Brazil actually does this much better. They've moved to green harvesting, which is where you mechanically remove the um, vegetation from the outside of the sugarcane stock. And that can be used, the byproduct um, for fuel, for things like um, more eco-friendly disposable utensils. So uh, there is another path here and Florida is just opting not to take it and it's coming at the expense of residents' health. Mm -hmm. But as I, I just I just find that to be just, just as, as a last word on this. Don't you just find that given, you know, when you when you see, you know, news coverage, for example, of wildfires elsewhere in the country and the devastation and, and, and almost like the dystopian like views. It's actually worse here in Florida. It's actually worse over in the Glades areas, you know, but but it's not something that we're going to do something about. We think that it is so. Right, exactly. So this issue isn't going away and we are going to stick with it. Um, we have a couple more bills to talk about. Uh, the next one is the Safe Waterways Act. So fill us in on that one, Gil. So um, um, recently, uh, last year, I guess, or two years ago, actually, uh, the legislator enacted the Clean Waterways Act of 2020. And, and you know, it, it was it was good as far as it went. But I think almost everybody, you know, who pays attention to these issues will tell you it didn't go anywhere near far enough. Uh, it was light on enforceable regulations to curb pollutions. And, you know, you got problems with pollution, obviously, uh, in Florida waters. We talked about nutrients uh, uh, earlier in, in terms of farm runoff and such. But how about fecal pollution from septic tanks, from, you know, aging sewage systems, that sort of thing. So this year, then, we have a, a bill called the Safe Waterways Act. It's Senate Bill 604, House Bill 393, which the sort of the main thrust of this would require Right now, state law merely authorizes county health departments to monitor public bathing places and post notices anytime fecal matter is determined to be elevated in the local waterway. Now, think about that. Current law does not require your local governments to inform you of this. Well, this legislation would require uh, uh, the Florida Department of Health to issue advisories, uh, and through the network of county health departments, specifically post and maintain warning notices at quote unquote public bathing places, which are areas used for swimming and other recreational activities where the water has been verified to be impaired by fecal indicator bacteria. This is kind of a no brainer in a lot of respects, right? If the water is contaminated, shouldn't uh, government, state government, local government be required to tell the people? Again, as of right now, that's not the case. This legislation would would do that. Uh, so, but unfortunately, here's another uh, here's another instance where sort of you know obvious or what should be obvious uh, uh, legislation that's going to be beneficial to a lot of people just doesn't isn't really going anywhere fast. So, uh, you know, uh, I think I believe both of these are on their first uh, committee stop. 
Uh, they're just really not moving. And uh, we I, we think it would be worthwhile, you know, for everybody to see them move a little faster. I'm not sure why people would be opposed to this, but apparently people are, Eve. <laughs> right. This this seems to be such a low bar. Let's warn people when their waterways are, are contaminated by fecal bacteria. I mean, this doesn't even get at harmful algal blooms, which is a whole other issue. So if we can't do this. I'm really concerned. And I have here on the screen, this is a, a front page editorial that the Naples Daily News published in 2019. Actually, I was in the news business back then, and I helped on this editorial. Um, and we tried to put the spotlight on how our water quality issues in Florida are public health issues. And if you recall the, the toxic algae crises on both coasts in 2018, there was really a lack of response from the Florida Department of Health. People didn't know if they could um, go in their backyard canals. They didn't know it was safe. And uh, some really good reporting from the news press in Fort Myers showed that the Department of Health was more concerned about its own image than responding to residents' concerns at the times. So, you know, I think we would echo the sentiment of this editorial. Um, this is about public health. And this bill that Gil just articulated is, is a simple thing we can do to warn people when there's a public health concern. So. I want to uh, just briefly, this is a uh, this is a couple paragraphs from an op-ed in the Palm Beach Post written by Howard Simon, uh, who's president of, the, president of the Clean Okeechobee Waters Foundation and a board member of the Calusa Waterkeeper. He writes, quote, it's alarming that contamination of Florida's rivers and streams by fecal bacteria is so widespread. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection, based on years of monitoring, have determined that nearly 9,000 miles of streams and rivers designated for recreation are impaired for fecal bacteria. The situation has continued for decades with no signage or inadequate signage warning the public of the contamination. A high counts uh, of bacteria indicate the water is not safe. Uh, this shouldn't be a heavy lift, he writes, but as noted, it seems to be heavier than we thought it would have been. So, it, If you want to help out on this one, we're going to post a link in the chat put out by Calusa Waterkeeper um, that indicates what committee chairs you can call to try to get this bill a hearing. Again, this is a simple one. This doesn't even get at the major phosphorus pollution issues that we talked about earlier. This is just right. warning people when there's crap in the water. <laughs> put it very bluntly. I'm sorry, it's Florida. We don't do that. Yes, yes. <laughs> we remain hopeful. There's, there's a, a picture. There's crap in the water. Look. <laughs> All right, moving along here. Um, we have one last bill to talk about, and then we're going to wrap it up by talking about the new Lake Okeechobee plan. Um, so. Blue Green Algae Task Force recommendations. Gil, can you illuminate this one for us? I can. So uh, the Blue Green Algae Task Force, once again, appointed by the governor, uh, issued a report in 2019. And so uh, with a bunch of recommendations as to what the state should do. Uh, the state did some of those things with 2020's Clean Waterways Act. Uh, it adopted some of the recommendations of the task force, but not all. And, and arguably some of the most key recommendations were ignored. Uh, so now here comes Senate Bill 832 and House Bill 561, which would enact some additional recommendations of the task force. Although, once again, it's not you know recommending or it's not uh, uh, proposing that we adopt all of them wholesale. Uh, the bill's central component would require the Department of Environmental Protection to implement a septic inspection program. Officials would have to inspect septic tanks every five years. If you're familiar with the issue of water pollution in Florida, you know that septic tanks are a problem. Uh, the big question always seems to be how big of a problem or how much of a contributor to the overall impairment of our waterways are septic tanks. I don't think anybody would argue that they're not a problem. And so that was one of the recommendations of the Blue Green Task Force, or Blue Green Algae Task Force, was that the state begin inspecting these things uh, once every five years. Uh, <clears throat> It also includes a mandated assessment of the cost of the state's basin management action plans, the BMAPs that we talked about earlier. Basically, this would require the state to go in and assess these things. Uh, are they working? Are they cost effective? I'm not sure about the cost effectiveness, but we know they're not working. Uh, so review of that would be good. So, you know, this legislation, I think, is OK as far as it goes. But we've said ever since the Blue Green Algae Task Force released its report, you know, the state brought these experts together, arguably some of the top people in the state on the issue of blue green algae. They put their heads together. They met for months. They came up with this document and the state kind of went, oh, OK, 
you know it's like we didn't you know why why would we assemble that expertise in the face of such a pressing problem and then just sort of piecemeal adopt what they recommended and not even that half the time you know our position eve is and i assume will remain that we think the state should adopt all the recommendations of the blue green housing task force Yes, absolutely. Um, this is another low bar um, piece of legislation. We think it should pass. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to have a ton of traction just yet, but there's plenty of time left in the session. And now on the, on the topic of septic tanks, absolutely. Let's, let's inspect them. If they're a problem, let's repair them. This is just such an obvious uh, fix. Um, unfortunately, septic tanks in some parts of the greater Everglades, notably the Northern Estuaries, the St. Lucie, and to some degree the Caloosahatchee, have been used as a boogeyman um, to detract against uh, the harm of Lake Okeechobee discharges when you can literally see blue-green algae moving from the lake down the canals out to the estuaries. So do septic tanks play a role in pollution? Absolutely. Down in Biscayne Bay, they're a big factor, um, but they are by no means the only factor. And, and the agricultural input of phosphorus into Lake Okeechobee is, is huge in fueling those algae blooms. So just worth noting um, so that we, we have the full picture here. This is complicated stuff. And, and the reason we we host these live stream events every month is to try to make them more understandable and, and we hope you find it useful. Um, so as we um, move on here, I just want to invite our audience to post any questions they may have in the chat and we will tackle as many of those as we can with the time we have left. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna move along here. There's another picture of algae from the 2018 blooms. Okay, so we, we're gonna back up from the, the Florida legislature at, at the moment and talk about the new Lake Okeechobee system operating manual. This is something that the Army Corps of Engineers has been working on for the better part of three years. Friends of the Everglades has been involved and um, we are pushing for a lake plan that is less damaging to the Northern estuaries um, since reduced volumes of lake water, sends more clean water south to the Everglades, and also sends more beneficial dry season flows to the Caloosahatchee estuary, which needs it during the dry season to some degree. Um, so here we are. Um, we are, are I'm going to say, and rewind it to about a month ago, we were looking at a better lake plan. It wasn't everything we wanted, a better lake plan. Um, and then we got a surprise a couple of weeks ago on, on January 12th, the state uh, via the South Florida Water Management District asked for control of more of the lake's water, a foot and a half higher in terms of lake water elevation compared to what we were talking about before. That's like half a million um, acre feet of water, a foot of, a foot of water on an acre is an acre foot. So a lot of water is the bottom line. And we're concerned that the political pressure that we know the state faces from big sugar, from agriculture, will lead to pressure to keep more water in the lake during the dry season for irrigation of sugarcane fields in the EAA. That's problematic because it cuts off flows to the Everglades, number one. Number two, it holds the lake higher and the lake stands to lose in this new lake plan because when it's high, it's um, submerged vegetation suffers. And then number three, if we have a higher lake at June 1st, when the rainy season rolls around, we're more likely to get discharges. So. We're tracking this closely. It's not legislative per se. Um, and we have an action alert that you can send to Colonel Booth, the commander of the Army Corps of Engineers in Florida, um, to ask them not to approve this buffer zone, this bait and switch, as we call it. So um, I think this is the easiest thing any of you can do right now to uh, create a better outcome in terms of how we manage water in Florida. So anything to add on that one, Gil? No, just to, uh, you know, to note that this proposal for this 1.5 foot buffer zone, I'll call it a zone because that's kind of more or less what it would amount to, sort of came out of nowhere. Uh, you know, it, it's not something that the, where we're aware that there was any sort of scientific study of and recommendations made. You know, normally in a pro, you know, the thing people got to understand about the Lowson process, unless you've been following this as closely as we have, you know, you may tend to get lost in the weeds. But this has been going on for years. OK, there have been meetings after meetings after meetings with literally hundreds of people representing all sorts of 
perspectives and stakeholders, it's been a very measured process. And I have to say, and we've told them this ourselves, U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is kind of running the show, has done a pretty good job of being transparent about everything uh, and, you know, letting stakeholders know what's going on. And this wasn't the Army Corps that did this. This was this was, this was the state, specifically the state uh, uh, South Florida Water Management District. But out of the blue, out of the blue comes this suggestion. And it's like, well, wait, wait a minute. Wait, how, how, how have we had this, this very measured process over all these years? And boom, all of a sudden, here's this proposal and this push, push, push for it. Political reasons. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, there is a suspicion that, you know, the ag water supply folks, the, the people who uh, the agricultural interests south of the lake, including Big Sugar, but not just them. Uh, are trying to get some sort of assurance that the lake's going to hold more water just in case, just in case they need it. You know, uh, as we've said all along, though, you start holding more water in the lake just in case, you're almost guaranteeing that at some point, you know, there's going to be too much water in the lake, which means discharges to the coast, which could mean algae, which could mean another crisis. And it means higher lake levels than you'd otherwise have to endure which is a problem for the lake ecology. So uh, once again, you know, this is sort of bad news all around. If you're interested in this, click the link in the comments uh, and add your voice to the course of people saying, no, we can't do this. Yeah. And, you know, the state is defending this by saying, well, we look at look at this governing board. Um, look at what we've done so far. We've been better on the environment, which is true compared to the governing boards under Governor Rick Scott. This governing board is better. Again, it was a low bar back then. Um, but, Welcome to Florida. We've got a yeah, low bar. Yeah, we could talk for an hour about that damage done separately. Um, however, this governing board has has tried to prioritize the environment within the constraints of their their rules. Um, the, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say if we gave the state the control of this additional water that they're seeking, this one and a half foot buffer zone, that they would do the right thing, this governing board. The problem is this is a 10 year lake plan and the governing board changes almost every election cycle. So the next governor, whoever that may be, whenever that may be, will have new appointees to this board almost certainly. And there's a good chance and there's a history to substantiate that that they will um, have agricultural interests as their number one priority, at least some of them. Um, so we could be in a situation where if we give this explicit reliance to the state on this buffer zone, this huge swath of Lake O water, that we will um, end up having larger volumes of discharges, higher lake levels than are necessary for the ecosystem. And again, remember, this isn't just about critters and pretty water and boating. This is about public health. We know more than ever about the public health impacts of toxic algae blooms. So the Army Corps of Engineers, to its credit, has included that in the new Lake Okeechobee system operating manual conversation from the beginning. I mean, they let's, let's be honest, they, they couldn't ignore it because people were so upset in 2018 and 2019. Mm -hmm. So they've addressed it to some degree. It's not as ironclad as we would like it, um, but handing this much control over to the state, which is more easily influenced than the Army Corps colonels by politics, really gives us pause. So um, this decision is going to be made in, in the next month or so here. It's really important to watch. And, and you can go to everglades.org and um, you know find out more about this and also fill out our targeted action, which is linked. And, All right. Just, so just go one ahead. Last, just one last thing, because it just occurs to me, you know, this, this ties back with our discussion about BMPs, best management practices, which really don't appear to be working and basin management action, action plans, which we know, thanks to the reporting over at TC Palm, aren't working. So the state has, you know, all this oversight, quote unquote, all these programs in place, and yet we are where we are. And then they turn around on this and say, trust us. I, I don't think so. So Right. We, we've been burned too many times and we, we just we want guardrails, right? Um the state is not perfect water managers and, and nor is the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, years pass because they're so rigidly adherent to the writing, the lake plan. Um, they, they open the levers and follow the document. But now that we're looking at a better lake plan, let's and it's not final yet. Let's make that lake plan as good as we can. Let's put those guardrails in there and not go with trust us. We just we we can't we can't rely on that for the future. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, we're going to tackle some questions now. Um, I saw one in the chat. It actually 
comes from Mike Connor. He's our Indian river keeper on the East coast. And he says, who will have last say in signing or vetoing any bills put forth? So that's an easy one. Thanks for throwing us a softball, Mike. Um, that will be the governor of Florida, Governor DeSantis. Um, he can veto bills. He will sign bills. And actually, last legislative session, um, we at Friends of the Everglades put a lot of pressure on Governor DeSantis to veto Senate Bill 88. That was the one that protected sugarcane burning um, from, from lawsuits. And um, he did end up signing that. And um, there are a couple other bills that um, we weren't thrilled about that got signed last year. So um, the buck does stop with him to some degree. Yeah. And, you know, DeSantis in the past has, you know, this year he has not really come out, you know, in favor or against really any sort of environmental legislation. His focus has been elsewhere. It's been on education. It's been on some other issues. So he hasn't really weighed in on any of the things that we've talked about here today. So whether he would sign them, whether he would veto them, it's hard to say on that on, based on that. Right. Yeah. And just you know, I get a lot of questions about our take on Governor DeSantis. I did a, a radio interview yesterday and got that question. And what I often say is Governor DeSantis very wisely in, in 2018, when he was candidate DeSantis, recognized how many Floridians really care about clean water and protecting our environment. He made it a central component of his campaign. He got elected and in his first weeks on the job, rolled out a multi-part executive order on the environment. Some of the follow through has occurred, not enough of it has occurred. So we need the rest of the follow through and we need to not erode these uh, state protections, the rules that are on the books, like the uh, rate tailoring of fertilizer application bill that we talked about. So, you know, if, if that sails through the legislature, which is our fear and lands on DeSantis's desk, um, I think he's going to really have a hard time defending it if he signs it. Yeah. I, you know, and I would go back to the Blue Green Algae Task Force, which he appointed you know, and but then they come out with their report and it's just, you know, he hasn't really pushed for the recommendations of that report to be implemented. You know, he's directed a lot of money, you know, more money than his predecessors uh, uh, to environmental issues, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but he just, you know, he initially sort of came out as a sort of a, a different kind of Republican, an environmental champion. Uh, and we haven't heard as much of that in recent years. So. Yep, well put. Uh, let's see, we can look at some more questions here. And if you're watching live on Facebook or on YouTube, if you post questions in the comments, we can see those and we will try to tackle some of those. All right, Sharon Livingstone asks, what role does the Ag Commissioner have in this? Um, I'll, I'll take a swing at that one and then let you chime in, Gil. So the Agriculture Commissioner is Nikki Freed. And she is um, she has a big role in the sugarcane burning part of the equation. As I said before, she could stop sugarcane burning tomorrow and phase in green harvesting. That is squarely in her purview. The uh, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services that she oversees also plays a big role in best management practices. Um, so they are actually overhauling some of these. Th these are the guidelines that um, Florida Department of Agriculture gives to farmers in terms of applying fertilizer, water use, and if they uh, enroll in these best management practices, they get a presumption of compliance. Um, so there is a big role for Nikki Freed to play. Um, and, and Gil, what would you say about that? Well, in terms of the specific legislation, it's not, you know, I mean, she could theoretically weigh in on some of this stuff, and she really hasn't. Uh, although, you know, again, this is the legislature. She's not part of the legislature. So whether these measures sort of pass or don't pass, she doesn't really have a whole lot of clout in terms of that. But there's the whole issue, uh, and this is an issue that we gotten into several months ago, of, of enforcement. Uh, and, and who enforces the environmental laws here in Florida? Who should enforce them? And there has been historically a, a bit of a disagreement, let's put it that way, between the, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and the DEP as to who is ultimately responsible for this. And that that uh, turned into a dust up maybe six months to a year ago uh, with accusations that, you know, a DEP wasn't, you know, Nikki Fried said this, DEP wasn't doing its job. The, the Department of Agriculture had referred something like 6,000 people to the DEP for enforcement. The DEP didn't do anything about it. 
And then you talk to the folks at DEP, DEP and they said, well, it's kind of not really that cut and dried. You know, it's 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 too complex to go into here in the time we have left. But, you know, I, Nikki Freed, the Department of uh, the, the Agriculture Secretary, whomever it is, certainly has an opportunity to use their bully pulpit on behalf of you know, maybe not necessarily specific legislation, but the causes, things like enforcement, things like pollution. Uh, you know, whether you think Nikki Freed has used that bully pulpit often enough or too often it may depend on your political leanings. I'm not sure. I think that's well said. Um, so we are winding down on our time here. And we know that um, everyone who watched live, uh, we want to be respectful of your time. And we really appreciate you joining in. This is such an important time to pay attention to what's happening in Tallahassee. It can feel so far removed from our daily lives, but it's really important to know that the decisions that are being made day in, day out in Tallahassee do have direct impacts on our lives, on our health, on our waterways, on the ecosystems we love and spend time in. So um, we're going to keep you updated at everglades.org. And I know Gil's going to be watching things at Boat Water. Um, the session runs 60 days total. So we have more than a, a month left. And I'm sure there will be plenty of opportunities for us to come back to you. So really appreciate it. Any final words from you, Gil? No, that's it. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Have a wonderful day.